To answering God's call. I'm your host, Stanley Ermolf. The aim of the show is simply to glorify God. And in the show, we invite priests and religious to share their vocation story and their inner life of dedication to God in the conviction that when we fix our eyes on God, we can do all things in Christ who strengthens us. Our theme for the show is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, which says, Let us not be overcome by the battle raging around us, but be strengthened by God's promise of an eternal reward which is far greater. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. Our guest today is Father Antonio Anderson, better known as Father Antonio. He's a salt priest, which means the society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. A very warm welcome, Father Antonio. Um, Antonio, very Spanish, and I googled Anderson, and that's seriously Swedish, and a lot Scottish, and very English. So you seem to be on a scale of high passion, and zero passion. Maybe you could tell us about that when we ask you to, first of all, tell us your, about your formative years. Growing up, your family life, your environment, your education, up to about 16, 18. Um, the year I say is we're just about ready to break out. At the age of 16, I remember a, a sister passed away, you know, Sister Francine, sister, sister of um, Sister Sarita. I um, was kind of keeping tabs on me. I was in standard six and then I left to go to St. John's College. And I said, Stanley, I hear that you're in bad company. And I said, who told you that? And she said, a little bird. And I said, well, the little bird may not be telling you the truth. And she said, look, let me ask you a question. If you put a good apple in a barrel of bad apples, what do you get? And I used to like teas and jinx and everything. And so I say, like, a barrel of good apples. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, don't fool yourself. So up to the tender age of 16 to 18, what was going on in your life? It's good to be here, Stanley. God, God bless you for your work on this show. Well, I can tell you one thing. I was not thinking of the priesthood. Yeah. I was uh, having fun in high school. I grew up in, a, in little towns in the state of Arizona in the United States, and God called me to be a missionary later. Um, but if, if he had told me when I was a junior or senior in high school, third form, fourth form, th that I would one day be working in Mexico and later in Belize, working largely with people who speak Spanish, not English, because I grew up speaking English, that I would be a priest and a missionary living far from my mom and dad, I probably would have run in the opposite direction away from the priestly vocation, but he knew that he couldn't give me too much responsibility or too much information too soon. So he let me have fun in high school. And what, what was I doing at that point? Well, I was on the wrestling team oh, really? uh, there at one of the sports that's popular in some of the states in the United States. It's, it's, it's Greco-Roman or Olympic wrestling, not the... Not the, not the Terribly violent wrestling, or uh, or the nor the mic, the the face mask wrestling of the Mexicans, uh, but real a real sport, the original Olympic sport. So that was my that was my high school passion, wrestling, and I think actually it was very formative for me, it, because it was it was it was hard. It was a very difficult, strenuous thing, and it taught us that. Well, as the as the as the sign yeah. used to say on the wrestling room wall, pain is weakness leaving the body. So it taught us okay. discipline. It taught okay. us that, that no pain, no gain was another wall, uh, yeah, sure sign on the wall. Enough. And so we, we learned that we could, 
you know, we could demand more of our bodies and that we'd be better wrestlers. And it's, and it, it, you, what's best in life is not immediate gratification, but we learn to, to, to uh, displace immediate gratification, suffer now so that you can reap the rewards later, the rewards of being a better wrestler and winning the match. Yeah, you know? the life of, of, of an athlete. Yeah. yeah, which later we can apply to the religious life. You know, okay. better to do some ascetics now, to do some asceticism, to do some prayer now, even when you don't feel like it, when you're feeling tired, better to go ahead and say yes to eternity and no to the immediate gratification of going to sleep or watching TV. Right. Okay. So wrestling was one passion. Um, very loving parents and. Uh, young Can you explain the Antonio and the Anderson, please? Well, to tell you the truth, as a priest, most of my work has been with Spanish-speaking people. So I, okay. I was in Spain as an early, as a, as a newly ordained priest. And then I worked with Mexican migrant farm workers in the United States for years, and I worked in a parish that was largely Mexican American for some years in Texas. But then for 20 years, I was in Mexico. And, you know, even though on my birth certificate, it says Anthony, that's not how anybody knows me. They know me as Padre Antonio. And so I think that's a way for me to be enculturated. I, want, I don't want to be known as the gringo priest. I want to be known as the Padre, you know, just your Thank servant, you. your spiritual father, you know. And so I, I kind of promote people actually calling me Antonio because I think it, it may, helps me to connect better with the Hispanic people. Okay, on the Anderson. Anderson? What's the well, An name? Anderson is, I got from my dad, and, the, okay. <laughs> and that is probably British. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't have any actual Mexican blood in me I, that I okay. know of, but it's more just uh, by adoption. I was yeah. I was adopted by being a missionary there in Mexico for so many years. Okay, good. And um, hmm. and your mom? Uh, mom is a great Catholic. Dad's a convert. Where's she from? She's she's from Arizona. They're both from Arizona. Okay. And she was the one that never missed mass. And Dad was a bit of an agnostic, but seeing her joy in the faith and seeing her uh, integrity as a Christian was very edifying for him. And I think that was a big influence for him. He was also a reader and a studier, and so read people like Saint Augustine. Oh. So my mom and and the truth of the faith both attracted him eventually to Catholicism. And I remember his first, I remember his baptism when I was 10 years old when he was baptized, for example. Oh, you said she was a convert? She, my mom helped that for, for him to be a convert. Oh, I see. Yeah, I, yeah. See. I thought you were saying she was. Mm -hmm. All right, so what would have led your father into reading the saints and that sort of thing there? Well, he, he liked truth. He, had, he, okay. he was what interested in the job truth. He, had? He, he was a lawyer. Um, All right. and okay. a college professor. So he was, he was in the intellectual world a bit and, mm. and searching for truth. And that was a very edifying example for me because they, they were both readers. When, when I was little, this was very formative. This was very important for me in my childhood. We were not allowed to watch television. Okay. Um, that drains your brain and weakens your will, in my opinion. And so we were allowed to watch one half hour of television per week. There was a show called Happy Days, and yeah, we watched it as that. a family. You remember yeah. that? Remember that? And a so we, it, was a, it was a family activity that we would do once a week, yeah. uh, and we would watch a half an hour and, and get a big kick out of it. But uh, the, of course, in those days, there's no, no, no internet, no people, no, no, no kids were tempted to, to be lost in their screens individually in their rooms. Um, uh, so what did we do with our time if we didn't watch TV and, and there was no internet? We read and we listened to mom who read books out loud to us as a family and we worked. And so yeah. it was a formative for our wills and our minds, our okay. intellects. Uh, and yeah, so that was very formative. And so seeing dad read and they would give me books about the lives of the saints like Padre Pio, I remember oh, reading a book that yeah. my parents gave me by Padre Pio that he wasn't yet or, uh, canonized even. He was just Padre Pio. It wasn't Saint Pio of Petrocina. Um, and so I began to dream about the possibility that I too could make the world a better place. What age are you now thinking about that? Uh, I, think, uh, I think early, you know, um, uh, through high school, throughout high school. All right. I, I didn't want to be a priest, but 
I did not want either to waste my life just making money. I, I, I understood that money doesn't buy happiness and, and what would be a life well lived would be a life helping other people to get closer to God, to live more human lives. I didn't know how I could do that, but I wanted to leave a mark on the world. I wanted to leave the world a better place somehow. Yeah. And so you were already, in a sense, in the grips of God, just not defining that as, I want to be a priest. Right. Good. Yeah. You didn't even know it? No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Because that's, a, that's an incredible influence, definitely, my folks, really. And mm -hmm. I was kind of wondering, how could you be drifting with an influence like that? But you weren't drifting. Mm -hmm. You were just not focused on being a priest. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. So let's begin the story then. So when did you first discern your call to become a priest? What challenges well, you had and how you overcome them? Okay. Well, I went off to college. Um, I went to a university. And I became a good apple Sur surrounded by some bad apples in college, <laughs> and I. But my 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 mission was to make the barrel a, a, a bunch of good apples. <laughs> that was I, mine too. Yeah, it doesn't work well. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work. But I was very intentional about this. I I went to a Catholic university that that was confused in its identity, and oh, so really? there was some there was some uh, honestly there was some heresy on campus. There were. It wasn't it didn't have a focused Catholic identity, but there were there were people teaching things contrary to the faith, and certainly a lot of people living in in, contra, in contradiction to the faith on campus. I, um, Particularly, well, I signed Paul? up I signed up for a theology class at this prestigious Catholic university, and my freshman year, and in the first class, well, there was a Lutheran teaching that class, and I said, you know, I I didn't come to this Catholic university to uh, to learn. Lutheran theology, I'd rather learn my own faith first, you know, be, be, sure. before I could become an expert in ecumenism or something. And so I dropped that class, ended up taking better theology there. Um, so there was some confusion there, but I knew that before I went there. So I went there with the focus that I was going to, to, uh, to the extent that I could, that I was going to be a good influence on other people, to be actually a missionary at the University of Notre Dame and to try to <clears throat> help people to, to know the true faith and um, not, necessarily, not, not necessarily a priest, but a missionary. Right. A, 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 yeah, a missionary in the broader sense of the world, sure. a, a word, because as Pope John Paul II says in his encyclical on missionary life, Redem Torres Misio, you are a Catholic to the extent that you're a missionary. Okay. A, and he repeats that several times. You know, the index, the exact index of your Christianity is how much you want to spread the faith and give it to other people. All right. And so I understood that. I didn't want to be a priest. But there was one teacher at Notre Dame, at the <clears> college, <throat> who called me into her office one day and asked me, have you ever thought of being a priest? She saw something in me. And I said to her, no, I never have thought of being a priest, the, despite the fact that we had never missed Mass as you know, growing up. Uh, but I never thought about it. And I did not begin to think about it seriously. Her... her her prompting uh, was... You would have been about what? I, I would have been about 17 years old. All right. So, uh, no, more like 20 years old. Yeah. More, more like 20 years old. Okay. And so I had never thought of the priesthood. This was the first person in life that ever asked me if I thought about it, 20 years old. Um, and I didn't take it too seriously. I didn't start praying about that. Um, but I continued to want to do something good with my life as opposed to just doing the boring thing <clears throat> of just making money. Um, I wanted to have an adventure making the world a better place. And so after I graduated from college, I came to Belize. And so I, what was your major in college? It was actually uh, the great books. It was, it was an intensive humanities program. Okay. And so we had some philosophy, a lot of literature, some music, some art, some architecture. Okay. Well, after Notre Dame, I, I looked at the Peace Corps. I was thinking of joining the Peace Corps and serving. That would be a way to serve and do some sure. good. But then I found a... F a little flyer on the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. And I said, well, this thing looks better than the Peace Corps. It's like a Catholic Peace Corps. I can be a lay missionary and serve for a year. And I joined up and they sent me to Central America, to the country of Belize. Mm. And so here I was in 1985, 86, as a lay missionary working some in Belmopan, some in Benque Viejo, a little bit in Melchor, Guatemala. Uh, and in that year, it became more clear to me that God might want me to be a priest. I was working more closely with priests. 
And here, and here I ran across a sister, a nun, a, one of the Salt sisters, um, Guatemalan, but working in Belize. And she told me one day, you're going to be a priest. <laughs> and I looked at that Who sister. Sister Lourdes Venegas okay. from, from Guatemala. And I looked back at her and I said, hermana, estás loca. <laughs> you're crazy, <laughs> yeah. sister. I, I understand that. Um, but there a seed was really planted. Okay. And I had to be honest with myself after that. I had, and so at one point, the great, the great decision I made, because my vocation largely comes from God, but the great step that I made was to go out under the Belizean sky and look up at the stars one night and say, okay, it's not very probable you want me to be a priest because priests are rare. They're one in a million, right? There's at least one in every 10,000 Catholics. It's only one priest. So it's not likely you want me to be a priest. And I don't want to be a priest. I, I'm, I have my eyes on marriage. But it doesn't make sense either to flee from your plan, to hide from your will, because you know me better than I know myself. And you love me more than I love myself. And so you want the best for me and you know what that best is. So if you tell me to be a priest and make it clear to me, I will do that. Bingo. You go for a priest. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so far, Antonio, earlier you were saying that this sister, this soul sister, pronounced on you, if you like, yeah, prophesied, whatever the word is, and um, said you're going to be a priest. But I kind of wonder what was going on. Something must have been stirring inside you uh, for that, that one prophetic moment to have such an effect. I, I would think that was a, almost a confirmation, yeah? And then you had your moment with the stars. Something was thrilling. What was, what was going on inside you and why? You know what? I'm, I'm not a mystic. And I, I don't see, you know, Jesus' face in the scar, stars or in yeah. the Eucharist. But I'm, I, I am pretty logical, I think, rational. And I just, I really do believe in God. I've never doubted God. I've, I've always trusted God and I've always believed in God. It's a very, uh, a gift that I'm very grateful for, the gift of faith. It's not to okay. be taken for granted. And so I really know... Probably a legacy of your parents. Right. And, and the studying that I've done, the, the, the Bible that I've read, but the philosophy that I've also studied, I know that God exists. I'm convinced that He exists. It's more evident to me that He exists than that I exist. I'm convinced that He exists. <laughs> and, and that He's loving and that He's wise. And so it doesn't make any sense to, to hide from Him. And this is going on at a pretty early age, 17 to 20. Right. Okay. Yeah, this, yeah discovering the wisdom of God and the goodness of God. Um, and it just, yeah, it just makes sense to cooperate with Him. He is to be trusted. He doesn't, he, he would never ask you anything that would be bad for you, dangerous, or too hard. He, he will challenge you, you know. He will challenge you to do things beyond your comfort zone. <clears throat> but, but because my parents put me to work in the garden... You know, and that was not in my comfort zone, but they obliged me to do physical labor, and that helped me to grow, to get over my own laziness and own selfishness. And because of wrestling, I, I had learned that discomfort is not the worst evil in the world. The worst evil in the world is, is sin, is sin. Um, okay. that, that's one of the things that I always preach about COVID. You know, it's important to be prudent about COVID, to wear the face mask, to wash our hands, you know, but it's also a it's also highly prudent to recognize the other dangers in our world. COVID is one danger, and we want to always do risk management, right? But if you do risk management regarding only one risk, then the other risks in your life are going to sneak up and hit you over the head. And I'm talking about the risk of sin, of you know, the risk of being less human, less loving, less virtuous. Um, and so while we want to be prudent regarding COVID, we need to keep in mind that there are other dangers like the devil, like the flesh, like the world, like sin. 
So it's just logical. Um, and, and I didn't want to, tell, to give God free reign to call me to the priesthood, but I had to. Logic said I had to. It doesn't. So I told him, I will do whatever you want. And so, so now I was This thinking in. was resonating with you early in life, 17 to 20. Yeah. Well, yeah, this logic, this discovery, the discovery of God was even before then. The discovery of the goodness of God and the, and the wisdom and the power of God. He, he is uh, the inexorable hound of heaven. He is pursuing us. And we, we do hide from him. All of us do. And that's called sinning, you know. We do run from him. But it is not logical it's it, it doesn't make any sense so you mm. when you sin you wake up you realize what you've done and you go to confession highly recommend that you go to confession because we, we all do flee from the hound of heaven but 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 it's better to be to be to allow yourself to be caught and that's what i was doing that night in belize of course he didn't tell me right that night that what he wanted for me i i told him what i wanted i wanted to be married and I continued to look for a, a, a spouse. And I went to Costa Rica after the year in, in Belize. I went to Costa Rica. And I even, I had a Costa Rican girlfriend at, at one point. Uh, but I asked the priest, how, how could I discern what God wants? Because, you know, I don't want to do just what I want and mess up my only life. God gives you one life to live. And so if you, if you intentionally or in your ignorance, uh, you know, not find what God wants for you to do with your life, well, then you, then you would run the risk of wasting the one life that you have. And that, that was something that I did not want to do. I did not want to waste my life. I wanted to live life to the max. You know, it's, it's ironic because a lot of the rock stars and the wealthy and the, and the people that, that try to find fulfillment in sex, drugs, and rock and roll, or wealth, or fame, they say they want to live life to the max. Well, so do I. But I, I just understand that living life to the max is living a godly life, living a mm. life in communion with the Most Holy Trinity, trying to be a saint. This is something that was clear to me even as a high school student. I didn't want to be mediocre. I wanted to be a saint. I wanted to be a saint. And so I and wanted to be a, a married saint. you that at what age? Well, that was in high school. That was wow. in high school. Yeah. yeah. Pretty good. Pretty yeah. Good. I, I realized that's the fullness of life, to, re, to, to, to be a saint. Why mess around and be mediocre and be something, be, be something less? Why waste your life? Um, so I went to Costa Rica, had the girlfriend. But I asked the priest one time, what could I do to find out, to hear God's call, to find out what he wants? And he asked me, are you going to daily Mass? And I said, no, I'm, I never miss Sunday Mass. Well, he said, what do you... Why are you asking me? That's too obvious. You should start going to daily mass. And then it's more likely you hear, hear God's call. Live a more sacramental life. And, and I did. Um, one thing that helped me was I, I, I am, I am, I've always been also enamored of the sacrament of confession. I've, okay. I, I, even from junior high age, ever since my first confession, I've seen that this is a good thing. Frequent confession is a good thing. And so when I was in college, I would go to confession. You can certainly blind yourself to God's call if you're walking in sin. And although I'm a sinner, just as anybody else, early on in life, I realized that I shouldn't be, I should never accept sin. I should never marry sin, so to speak, or be content with sin, you know. But I should always go to confession. And so I, I really promote frequent confession, I, and I do it myself. I, I w what I would really recommend to people, everyone who's watching, is that if you go to confession every month, that's what I call frequent confession, and, and then you go to communion every week, at least every Sunday, maybe, maybe uh, you could go in uh, weekdays also, but at least receive communion every Sunday, go to confession every month, this is a sure path to salvation. Very difficult, very hard to conceive that you would not be saved if you take advantage of this sacrament of freedom and love and peace and holiness, which is the sacrament of confession and communion. So I wanted to be married, but I also wanted to be a saint. Um, and that's when I did the great, the great pilgrimage. 
the great hitchhiking pilgrimage. In Costa Rica, I wanted to go home for Christmas to Arizona, but I didn't have any money to buy a plane ticket, so I hitchhiked from Costa Rica to Arizona. <laughs> wow, that's big. It was an adventure. It was an adventure, riding with truckers through Nicaragua. Nicaragua was communist at that time. Mm. So I was from the United States. I had a, an American passport. I felt like a very a persona non grata, traveling through the communist Nicaragua. Um, but I, you, you make beautiful friends with salt of the earth people because the people that pick you up when you're hitchhiking are typically people that you have hitchhiked themselves and yeah, they've, they've yeah, known some yeah. poverty themselves. And so I made it to Honduras and then I got stuck because according to something that I had read, there would be little, a little ferry or something I could take from Puerto Cortes <clears throat> to southern Belize, but I got there and it was the off season. There was no way to get from Belize to, uh, to from, from Honduras to Belize via the Caribbean. So I started begging and hitchhiking on the wharf there and I found a banana barge traveling from that port yeah. to Belize and so okay. I hitchhiked on a boat, got my way to Big Creek. Big Creek. It yeah. was Big Creek and I ended up hitchhiking in the back of a dump truck on the back of a tractor and I finally made it to Benque Viejo and in Benque Viejo um, well, where, that was like home. That was home, yeah. That was home. That was where I'd been the year before. Yeah. I asked Father John McHugh of Happy Memory, the holy I pastor of Benque Viejo. I asked him, Padre, could you give me a retreat? I really want to know what God wants for my life, but I don't know what he wants. Could you give me a vocational retreat? Yeah. And it was a very busy day for him. I didn't realize fully why, but he said, you know what? I don't have time today, but I'll give you the... And he gave me a Bible and he put some bookmarkers in it and he pointed out some passages in sacred scripture I could read. And I went out into the jungle next to the Mopan River. I sat down next to the Mopan River and I did not, I did not have to open the Bible because God gave me a one-time grace in my life of knowledge that was, I call it being knowledge, because the message that came to me, it wasn't in my head, I didn't hear anything, I didn't see anything, but what I perceived in my whole body and soul was you are to be a priest. Good. You are to be a priest. It's going to be a being thing, and there's, and there's going to, it's, it, that's what you are, that's, what, that's who you are, you're to be a priest. And I could have said no to it. God always leaves you free. I could have said no even then, it was subtle, but it was unmistakable. And I decided to do what was logical. I said, okay, if that's what you want, if that's what, if that's what my destiny is, I will not fight that. I, will, I can see that. So I never opened the Bible. I didn't want to confuse the message. I simply stood up and I jumped into the river and baptized the whole experience, took a swim, <laughs> went back to talk to Father McHugh, and he was, he was rejoicing. And it turns out why he was busy, it was the 12th of December. It was Our Lady of Guadalupe's feast day. Okay. I'm pretty sure she is very instrumental in my vocation. Yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> so, so then, why did you choose to become a soul? Well, you know what? Father McHugh is a salt, is he? That he is, and I had been a lay missionary with salt. So, layman with salt, obviously I was going to just be a priest with salt. I, it never occurred to me to look at my home diocese in Phoenix or look at the Jesuits or the Dominicans or any of the big orders because this was already my family. Okay. Yeah. Did you ever cross path with Father Eduardo Monte Mayor? Because sure. I think he was born in Arizona, did a lot of his, spent most of his life in Mexico. That's right. Well, I was actually the vocation director of the Society of Our Lady, and so I was responsible for bringing him into the Society of okay. Our Lady. He came a few years after me, and it's a real joy that he's now a brother of mine in the priesthood yeah. in the Society of Our Lady, the Most Holy Trinity. Great guy, too. Yeah. yeah. Good. So you started with the soul, and that was just kind of like automatic yeah. as a decision, okay? Um, hmm. I mean, you were transformed before you became a priest. I have a question here. What was most transformative when you were studying to be a priest? <laughs> Besides jumping into the Mopan, baptizing, you know, self-baptism. That's I, right. Yeah, you know, that's good. <laughs> that sounds heretical. Watch out. Um, Couldn't wait for my cue. <laughs> uh, what was most formative? I what, what was most formative was the witness of holy priests. 
There were two holy priests that were very powerful influences on my life. Besides my friends who are in heaven, the dead priests like St. Augustine and Padre Pio, people that I had read and became my friends and were very influential in my life, the, the dead priests and, uh, who are alive in heaven. But, but the ones that are here below that affected me so much were the founder of our order, Father James Flanagan and Father John McHugh. Watching them, just being with them, I said, this is a real life, a life of service, a life of love, a life where you're not thinking of yourself, you're thinking of everybody else and you're thinking of God, a life of worship. We were made to worship, we were made to pray, and, and that's what makes us happy is when we're in communion with God and we're serving God's people. So I saw these very happy priests, mm -hmm. and, and I, I didn't discursively you know, take this all apart in my head, but I realize now that I, I was... I was understanding they are happy because they are holy. They are happy because they're loving servants of God and of their neighbor. And this is something that was very attractive to me and very formative. Another thing that was formative was, was philosophy, believe it or not, more, maybe more than theology. Um, just the truths of solid philosophy that that there are only two kinds of being. There's absolute being that, that, that is not dependent on anything or anybody else, being in itself, and then there's contingent being, or the rest of us beings from the trees to the, to the rocks, to the stars, to the human beings, we are all contingent beings. Our existence depends on God holding us in existence. That's a philosophical truth, and so, once again, and the other one is total independence from all of this contingency. We, independent, that's right. God, there's, there's God, and then there's all of the other beings that, are, that exist. Right. All these uh, dependent beings sure. depend on Him for their existence. Absolutely. And then there's absolute <clears throat> being who doesn't need anybody, not dependent on anybody. <clears throat> so He's absolutely other, and yet Christianity teaches us He's absolutely intimate to us. So He's the best of both worlds total power, total wisdom, total holiness, and at the same time, he's my father. And so, it's, what a, just the nature of God is so exciting to me. The very nature of God is, is so exciting. And so that, um, those truths continue to be exciting for me. And, and I get excited with the opportunity to preach, for example, to, and, to, and to wake people up to the beauty of God, the goodness, the truth of God, okay. heaven, the church. Okay, just before we go to break, could you tell us a little bit about your responsibilities as a priest? Well, right now, I'm the pastor of Our Lady of, Most, uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel Parish in Benque Viejo, okay. which means that I oversee the schools there too. <clears throat> that means the junior college, John Paul II Junior College. I have a certain authority of overseeing the junior college. Also the high school, uh, I have the help of other priests there. I'm not alone, but... Uh, Mount Carmel High School, and then we have four primary schools uh, in the villages around Benke and in Benke. We have big, big primary school there in Benke, a thousand students. So um, that's what I'm up to now, and I've, ha I've had different responsibilities earlier in my priesthood, but for the last two and a half years I've been in Belize, and that's what I'm up to. I'm in western Belize um, at the service of the good people there along the Guatemalan okay. border. And you're mentioning too, uh, on a diocese basis, you have responsibility for the whole diaconate program? Well, that's true too. Bishop Lawrence has asked me to oversee the formation of permanent diaconate, <laughs> permanent deacons for the diocese. And right now we have 10 men uh, from around the country studying to be permanent deacons. And so that keeps me busy too. In fact, oh, I'm just coming from visiting uh, Percival Gideon in Orange Walk. He's mm. our candidate from Orange Walk. And I was up there with him and his family uh, last night and this morning. Yeah, man, man, when I intend, you gave me a gift of a book that you wrote, which you say this is your COVID writing. Could you tell us two minutes about that? Well, we'll, we'll do a, a commercial for the people at home. It's called Pray or Die. It's a very drastic title, very, uh, a very harsh title perhaps, but, but it kind of suits me and my logic. Mm. We, we either are of God or we're not. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So you're with Jesus who is life and gives life and gives eternal life. 
or you're at odds with him and you're seeking eternal death, God, God forbid. But, but obviously, I, in my priesthood, I've served people that, who didn't want to be served. For example, people who work in drug cartels in Mexico. I was working among the drug cartel people for almost 20 years in Mexico. And in that time, I met people who were on the way to hell. Killers, murderers, they're on the way to hell. Of course, there's room for their conversion and their salvation. As long as there's life, there's hope. But, but in fact, you and I and all of us are either on the way to hell or on, on the way to hell or on the way to heaven. There are no two, there are no other roads. There's a, there are only two ending places for human beings, heaven or hell. And so if you pray, you're on the right road. And, and I got the inspiration for the title from St. Uh, Alphonsus Liguri, who says, those who pray will be saved. Those who do not pray will not be saved. He's a doctor of the church, much more authoritative than I am. With that, we'll go to work. Thank you. Welcome back. Okay, Father Anthony, Antonio. <laughs> We've been focusing so far on your call for the priesthood and as you know, your responsibilities as a priest. Yeah? I would like us to focus now on your inner life of dedication. And you've been saying a lot of it before you became a priest, you've been saying a lot. To God, in a sense, what really makes you take as a person and as a priest? But first, let me say a few words to our audience. From time to time, we'll be using the words intimacy or intimate, referring to a sense of closeness that derives from sharing ourselves in a relationship that is trustful, deep, and wholesome, in this case, with God. An easy way to understand intimacy is by the phrase intimacy. So intimacy is all about sharing who we are at the deepest, most trustful level. I'm going to quote here St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 30 to 31. Jesus tells us in an answer <clears throat> to a question from a young man that the first great commandment is to love God with our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole mind, and with all our strength. In other words, we are to love God intimately, or if you like, with everything we've got. Then Jesus added the second great commandment, which he said is like the first that we are to love our neighbors ourselves, and which I believe he elevated to love one another as I have loved you on the night before he was crucified. On that same night, Jesus also talked about eternal life with his apostles, saying in John 17, 3, that eternal life is knowing you, Father, is praying to his Father God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. If I understand this correctly, Jesus is saying that we will spend our eternity in heaven getting to know God intimately, the eternal face-to-face, -face, as St. Therese, the little flower, puts it. Now let's try to get our minds around this for a moment. Jesus himself tells us that our first purpose in life is to love God intimately and that we will spend our eternity in heaven getting to know God intimately. I read a reflection recently which defined uh, eternity as the glorious and endless present. Now here's the bottom line. Our infinite and glorious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit desires to have an intimate relationship with each and every one of us, and then some, in this life and for all eternity. How delightfully incredible. So, Father Antonio, could you share with us the first time you felt a desire to have an intimate relationship with God and how important to you is that relationship 
No. Stanley, thank you for that question. <clears throat> we need to talk about divine intimacy and, and our calling, our vocation to not be alone. So many people are, feel alone, they feel lonely and sad. Nobody understands me, nobody loves me. That's a lie from the devil. I want to go to answer that question when I first felt a call to intimacy with God. I'm actually going to go back before I felt anything. Because we, as Christians, we understand that feelings are important, but they're not the most important thing. The most important thing is reality and truth. And then when your feelings catch up with that and they are consonant or in coherence with <clears throat> the truth, then they're good feelings. They're, they're appropriate, they're healthy feelings. But sometimes our feelings actually uh, deceive us. So when, when was I first intimate with God? It was in my baptism. And so I was baptized at nine months old. I've already scolded my parents about that. They waited too long, right? I, I, I would say to all parents who are watching us, make sure to baptize your kids soon after they're born because it's very important <clears throat> for them to start walking in the grace of God. In baptism, what happens is intimacy happens. God starts dwelling in you and you start dwelling in God in a powerful new way. You become supernatural. You become part of the family of God immersed in God. There's an, what I call an inter-indwelling. God dwells in you, you dwell in Him. That is the reality of grace, the reality of what happens in baptism. Do you feel that? No. Most babies, when you put the water on their head as you're baptizing them, you don't see them break out in a great no. smile or something. Sometimes they cry, sometimes they don't seem to be too aware of anything that's going on. But the truth is, Baptism changes your life. Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II, who ordained me to the priesthood, when he went back to Poland for a visit, at his first visit back to Poland when he was Pope, he went to the hometown where he grew up, Wadowice, and he went to the church where he had been to Mass many times. And his first thing that he did was he went to the baptismal font where they had baptized him and he kissed the baptismal font. He understood what we should all understand that more important than ordination, more fundamental to my salvation and my happiness and, my, and fulfilling, living a fulfilling life is that God has taken me to himself through baptism and adopted me and dignified me with a supernatural dignity. So intimacy happens in baptism. The rest of our life is an attempt by us through our free will to catch up to our baptism, to try to live our baptism, to not contradict our baptism, right? Because we sometimes live, Stanley, as if we were not sons and daughters of God. We live as if we were sons and daughters of the devil or sons and daughters of the world, but we belong to God. And so we need to, we need to fulfill that. We need to be coherent with that. Now, to answer your question about a more... Like, when did that realization kick in? Well... I understand the truth of what you're saying about mm, baptism, but well for then, our part, when did that start really meaningfully resonate with I you? I can tell you exactly when and where I was living. I was living in a little town called Prescott, Arizona, and my mom showed me the picture the other day, and I was seven years old when I received Jesus onto my tongue and into my heart. The catechists had done their job. My mother had done her job. I knew that I was receiving the almighty, all-powerful God of the universe in the form, the apparent form of bread, right? Yeah. It's just a, it's just a deceptive appearance. But what I was really receiving, receiving was God himself coming inside of me. That's intimacy. And so I knew that at the age of seven, and I was grateful. And I've never doubted that since then. And what a powerful intimacy we have. And now I have the gift as a priest to give that intimacy to other people and to help bring them into intimacy with God through the Eucharist in Mass, but also in adoration. Okay. So, how transformative is that? This conviction, if you like, of this truth that God, way back at baptism, nine months old, invited us, took us into intimacy, thanks to what his son did for us on the cross. Huh? Mm -hmm. But then it takes a while for us to mm -hmm. realize that. Mm -hmm. 
and, and, and then, then to begin to live it, to be transformed. Um, so how important is that for you right now in your life? Is that a continuum or that was a one-off shot and then we're back to normal? Or mm. How does that work? The reason that I'm on this planet is one reason. Transformation in Christ. I need to be transformed. I'm not holy. I'm not a saint. I'm not another Jesus in all of my thoughts and attitudes and uh, words and actions. I, I, I'm, I'm falling short. So it's a constant conversion. And there's a great need for conversion in my life. And it's the same for, for most human beings. Our Lady, you know, made it farther than, than all of us and never sinned. But, uh, but yeah, intimacy is something that's already and not yet. It's not right. yet perfect, but it's already started. Yeah. In baptism, it was started. Seeds Se been planted. Yeah, and, and so I need that. So I need, I need my holy hour every day. If I don't have a holy hour every day, then I don't have a good day. You know? And I don't treat the people as well as I should. I end up not treating myself as well as I should. Okay. Now, it, is that a community holy hour, or that's something that you have worked into your life yourself? Well, thanks be to God, I, I have the support of a community, of religious order. I don't think I would have the discipline to have a, a holy hour just myself. I would, I would tend to be kind of a workaholic, and I'd be out there serving God's people, and I wouldn't necessarily take the time for the holy hour. I think knowing myself, okay. I would be weak in that way. So I'm thankful <laughs> that I have a community. Interestingly, you know? so serving God's people is not necessarily synonymous Right. With your moment of intimacy with God. That's right. There has to be a balance. Now, St. Vincent de Paul said, if you're, as a priest, if you're praying your breviary and a poor person knocks on the door and you leave your breviary, you leave prayer to go serve him, you're not leaving God. Because Jesus does say, and we have to believe the sacred scripture, he who gives a cup of cold water to a poor person gives it to me. So Jesus is really in the needy and the poor and the confused and the sinner who wants to go to confession and so my modus operandi, imitating the founder of our order, is to not say no to people. What I saw in this beautiful priest, Father Jim Flanagan, the founder of the Society of Our Lady, was that he would never say no to anybody. And that means he would not sleep very much. He didn't get much sleep, four hours a night, because he was just serving and serving. When he wasn't serving, he was praying. When he wasn't praying, he was serving. But he never said no to a bishop who wanted some spiritual advice. He never said no to a person with mental illness that wanted some counseling. He was just always fiat voluntas tua. And so I try to be open to God's people okay. and wh whatever their needs are. And at the same time, I need to have that time to recharge my batteries and be one with the, re the reason for my existence is God himself primarily. Just like the angels in heaven, their prime reason for existence is to worship God. Their secondary reason for existence is to do His will and serve us. Yeah. So it is with each of us. But then even Jesus in the Gospels, I mean, He had to take time to spend with His Father. And, and, and basically, in the meantime, He was teaching, He was doing miracles, He was reaching out to, you know, the, the poor and unfortunate and everything else. And yet He needed time with His Father. Now that's a... I read a... Um, you know, some, something my um, Bishop Barron, our Catholic Bishop, who says, the thing we de desire most in life is intimacy, and the thing we fear most in life is intimacy. Hmm. And then I read a book by uh, a lady writer who said, you know, intimacy is not only about us and God and we and our spouse and our close relations. We should the internet with everybody and in everything. So give me a break. What, 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 what do you think she's saying there? So that, you know, serving the people becomes synonymous with mm -hmm. expressing intimacy with God. I appreciate what are what we missing? I appreciate what she's saying because so often the relations that we have with one another are superficial, you know, and, and I, w I would like to avoid superficiality. Um, I would like to avoid speaking with people just about the weather or about yeah. sports, so things that don't... Really, so. Yeah, I, I'd rather have deep conversations and, and really arrive at the heart of the matter and and you know end up really really loving people and allowing myself to be known it's it is scary intimacy i agree with father baron or bishop baron it's, it's scary to be intimate to reveal your real heart to people yeah. it's a little scary 
Uh, at the same time, we are not islands. We, we are made, we are social creatures by our very nature. We're, and we don't, we're not saved alone. I need my salt brothers and sisters. I, I need the parishioners. The parishioners themselves pray for me. I need them as, just as they need me. We, we, we're family creatures and we're only saved in a family, in a spiritual family. The Catholic Church being the prime example. Sure. Okay. Um, can you share with us some, um, Father Antonio, what an intimate relationship with God may look like and how do we get there? We're talking to lay people now. You know what? I want to send people to this book because we're, we only have another 15 minutes or 10. Um, and this is worth a lifetime of reading. So read sacred scripture to listen to God. You know, we, we don't deserve to have the Bible in our homes. It's an amazing, unmerited gift that God has bent down to us from his infinity, from his, from his uh, eternity. He has, he has leaned down and bent down to us and he speaks in our own language through sacred scripture. We don't deserve it, but he's decided to, to give us that communication. So listen to God through sacred scripture, but read other good books too. I've been edified my whole life by reading Lives of the Saints and books by saints. Um, I can recommend this to you because it's not really my work. It's the, it's the wisdom of a lot of saints and the wisdom of sacred scripture on the topic of prayer. And, and, you'll, and you can get this at Guadalupe Media Bookstore here in Belize City next to Divine Mercy Parish or in the, at the parish in Benque Viejo because we're not going to do justice to the, to the answer. But the fact is that when I was young, and here's a, a, a little advice for you moms and dads and grandparents out there. When I was mom, young, my mom would always ask us when we were going to sleep, Hey, have you said your prayers already? Don't forget your prayers. This was my mom's unf unflagging, unfailing mantra that she repeated every night. Don't forget your prayers. Don't forget your prayers. It was the four words that became famously, you know, set in, in our minds. Don't forget your prayers. Don't forget your prayers. So we would pray every night. And then during the day, mom would teach us to pray because when a bad thing happened to us, maybe we fell down and hurt our knee, mom would say, offer it up. So she taught us to relate ourselves to God, relate all of our needs to God, tell God thank you, ask for his help, offer it up, don't forget your prayers. These were advices that my mom gave to us. She didn't, we didn't pray too much together as a family. We didn't pray the rosary every, every day as a family, which I would recommend that you do as a family. But we weren't there. We weren't at that level yet as a family. We, didn't, we did not pray the rosary every day as a, as a family. But, but we learned how to pray. And we learned of the importance of praying always. Jesus says in sacred scripture, pray always. This is not something that's impossible. Jesus would not ask us to do something impossible. That would be absurd of him. That would be evil of him to ask us to do something impossible. If he asks you to pray always, it's because it's, it's possible. And so I'm, I'm on that tr trail, I'm on, I'm on that way of, of trying to be more conscious that God is with me. Living in the presence of God is the goal. Constantly, always, every waking moment, living in the presence of God, that's the goal for you and for me, to realize. And then if something bad happens, you don't get mad because you realize, well, God is right here, God's going to help me take care of this. Or you don't become disproportionately sad or distraught or disheartened um, or you, you, you don't stop trusting um, God because he's with you all the time and, and you see how he helps you get through things. So living in the presence of God keeps you from pride too because when you, when you do something well and people laud you and they thank you, you, you don't get a big head because you realize, well, it was really God working through me. The fact is that God is with us. So we need to wake up our, psych, our psyche, our conscious mind and, and just live in the real world. Sometimes young people have told me, Padre, you need to get real. You need to get real, Padre Antonio. You need, you need to live in the real world. When I tell them that they're called to be saints, and they say, no, I'll be real, Padre, get real. But the fact is that in the real world, there's nothing more real than God, and there's nothing more real than the presence of God in your life. The fact is we're not aware of it, so we, to the extent that we're not aware of God's presence in our lives, we are the ones who are living a, an attenuated, ghostly, unreal life. So I would say to all of our viewers, 
get real, live in the presence of God, communicating with Him, praying always, thanking Him for little things throughout the day, praising Him throughout the day. Make sure you have a schedule of prayer where you're at, where you're at prayer at certain times in your day. But then also fill your life with spontaneous prayer as well. Both, both scheduled prayer, community prayer, personal prayer, spontaneous prayer. We need all the different kinds of prayer there is. Prayer of thanksgiving, prayer of praise, liturgical prayer is essential for Catholics. In other words, the prayer of the Mass is the highest prayer. The most powerful prayer is the prayer of the Mass. Confession is prayer. When you go to confession, that's also a kind of liturgy itself and it's a very powerful prayer. I call it remedial prayer because you're, you're telling God in, in the sacrament of confession, you're telling Him, I want to give you the best version of myself. I'm sorry for my sins. I want to do better. With your help, I want to be a saint and I want to give you a better version of myself. That pleases Jesus. That's a very pleasing prayer okay. to Him. I have one final question, okay. which you've probably answered several times already, but in a summarized, bottom line, sort of way, please tell our audience, the lay people out there like me, how important it is for every one of us, not only priests and religious, to have an intimate relationship with God. And you've already mentioned a number of ways to start that, but how important is that for everybody to have a lay, uh, to have a, 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 I'll, I'll tell an you, intimate Stanley, relationship with God? Nothing could be more essential than prayer. It is, it is the essential habit that we need to have and that this world needs us to have. The reason the 20th century almost marked the end of the human race through the world wars, through Hitler and Stalin and people like that, the, the communist uh, crushing evil system, which continues to crush people in communist China today, in North Korea, with the dictator there. The evil that was unleashed in the world in the 20th century was because people stopped praying. They stopped believing in the, in the sovereignty of God and started thinking, man is sovereign. I'm in charge. I don't need to pray. I don't need to put myself under God and be obedient to anybody. I would rather run the world my own way. And so the world I'm sure we'll survive the 21st century only if a, if a, a, a sub certain substantial n number of us continue to pray. Prayer is necessary for the continuation of the human race so that we don't end our, 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 our time on this planet. Prayer is also necessary for the health of your family. Your family will explode without a relationship with God. And we see that happening around us. Your parish will not be a healthy parish without a substantial number of prayer warriors on their knees before the Blessed Sacrament. So if the priest is not a prayer warrior, there better be a bunch of lay people that are prayer warriors in your parish, or it's going to be a very lukewarm parish with very little fruit. And so it is with every social organization, and so it is with the country. The way Belize prays, marks the future of Belize. If Belize remains humble, if Belize remains a nation that knows how to get on its knees and recognize the sovereignty of God, the future of Belize is bright. If not, then not so much. And so it is with every person individually as well. well unfortunately, we have to come to an end. Otherwise, you want to throw us out. So this has been Answering God's Call. Our guest today was Father Antonio Anderson, better known as Father Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Stanley Irmo, and until we meet again, we fix our eyes on what is eternal. Thanks for tuning in, and God bless. <laughs>